Good morning. This is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru, and this is the uh, first of my official blabs. We are talking today about playing to passion, building your social skill and business acumen through gameplay. Now, uh, there are a considerable number of you that may be familiar with my background, and there will be still others that won't. So in order to kick off this first episode uh, appropriately, let me give you a little information about my background. I started playing games, tabletop games, at a very young age. I remember being three and four years old, peering over the top of the playing card table and just wishing I was able to participate. My grandparents and parents utilized the card table, if you will, as their center of communications. And weekend after weekend, we would go to visit grandma and grandpa and they would, within the first five minutes, already be setting up the board, setting up the table for whichever game they were going to play. And the majority of them were based on a traditional playing deck of cards. And so naturally, as a youngster, I started with the, the simple things like, oh, war, which is very funny for kids to learn, but uh, war and slapjack and things of that nature. But pretty soon I was wanting to um, elevate my game, if you will, and desired to learn to play cribbage and canasta, king's corners, and the entire array of games that mom and dad and grandma and grandpa were playing. So what I learned and observed in those early years kind of set the tone for my entire life because I learned that the tabletop, the board game arena, if you will, was the primary methodology for conveying meaning. Now, when I went to public schools and uh, originally you, you could still find checkerboards and chessboards in classrooms when, when I was young and the teachers would take the effort on occasion to break out those games to engage the, the, the kids in the activity of learning to play. And it dawned on me very early that the entire educational process is fundamentally a series of games and game type activities intent on building a level of competitiveness within the student base, but also a subsummation, if you will, of the personnel will of the players. Now, this initial video uh, that we're going to be, or that we are recording, is supposed to be the, the gravy, the sweet stuff, the good part of what I do and uh, the exciting part. So we will be looking at particular titles of games and how they can achieve the goal of teaching additional social skills and developing a stronger business ethic and business acumen. But in this early part, I want to just talk about the fun, the entertainment value of games. When, when we look at uh, human engagement, by and large, it's observational or vicarious in nature. Uh, that is to say that we don't spend a lot of time directly conversing with or having a dialogue with the newscasters, the weathermen, etc., that are on television. Instead, we receive information directly from them. And that has everything to do with the original mechanics of contact. It was untenable for individuals to be able to broadcast back to the radio or TV stations. And so the collective consciousness, I guess you would say, of the United States and perhaps the, the world in general shifted from empirical statements by government governance and um, the political and uh, secular response of media to those edicts or whatever to a situation where uh, editorial opinion uh, became equal with 
the facts. I remember when I was a young man, there was a gentleman that was very greatly revered in the media marketplace by the name of Walter Cronkite. And what's really struck me even when I was a young kid was that he would say at the end of his broadcasts, and that's the way it is, this 30th day of April and good day. And, and the point was his statement of the news included his editorial content. And I don't necessarily mean him personally, but uh, more broadly, the editorial content of his station was being equated with the truth and not leaving any room for their competitors to be presenting any alternative information because after all that's the way it is so what happened over the last oh, 30 40 years of educational processes is that the educators have become unilaterally the authority on subjects and when they spoke truth occurred, whether it was intentional or arbitrarily a response to their commentary. One example I can think of in particular it was a quote at some point, and I forgive me, I don't have the reference here in front of me, but Alan Hassenfeld uh, was the CEO of Hasbro. It was a, a company owned by initially by his family, hence the name Hassenfeld Brothers or Hasbro. His statement was a response to uh, perhaps criticism that the line of products that Hasbro was making was elevated or too cerebral. But it, at some point he determined and stated that uh, the organization would no longer make games targeting adults, but would instead only make games products targeting children because after all, games are for children. And in his defense, the argument that games are for children fundamentally stems from the mechanics of so, uh, sociology. As uh, sociology was an emerging science in the 1950s and 60s, there was a need to define the very terms of human interaction in a way that would allow the observers to discuss the interaction regardless of the personalities. In other words, so the sociology studies are fundamentally a look at humanity minus all the humans. So in order for that to occur, they determined that any given interaction between two individuals without any respect to the personality or background of the individuals had to be defined as a game. And because they needed that mechanic to be uh, dissociated from personalities, they defined any game as an activity that in and of itself produces no net value. Now, of course, mathematically what they were speaking of is they do not did not want the concept of a human interaction to, uh, by its own existence, shift the responses of the individuals. Because if they're going to study humans as a whole without regard to the individual humanity of those individuals, it had to be isolated. And so the creation of this concept of game theory arose from that very dry, very abstract definition of a game. Now, consider that the majority of students going through the university processes do not or are not required to take an entire raft of human humanities or social sciences. 
but rather have to take one or two a smattering thereof. And in this case, now that now that the definition of game theory includes this very dry definition of game, if you are a person who just are a happenstance student and you hear that phrase that games have no net value, then Alan Hassenfeld's theory sounds about right. You don't want adult human beings interacting in activities that have no value. So naturally, therefore, games must be, by definition, uh, for children. Now, that leaves a big hole in human interaction because the truth is, I know this is perhaps going to be a revelation, but the truth is that every aspect of education comes through games. Uh, as I mentioned, when you go through the public school system, you're competing from day one with the other students. You're also competing with the teacher because they're the ones who set the objectives and the uh, win conditions, I guess you would say, for each day's activities. But you're also competing with yourself because you are attempting to gather the information from the teacher in as expedient a method as possible so that you can uh, go on with you know, living your childish life and playing and, and enjoying yourself. Therefore, when we talk about the educational process, those that participated in games all the way through up into their adulthood have been consistently experiencing the very training tools that define social interaction. Now, going into the subject of human interaction, let's talk for a minute about what it is that a game really is defined as. And by uh, redefining game, I think maybe we will be able to get a more useful uh, access, if you will, to the human condition and human development. So for clarification, the definition that I utilize for games is any activity that engages two or more human beings in a finite time period with defined objectives and some mechanism for human involvement and resolution of an arbitrary or intentional conflict. Wow, pretty dry, right? So just, just to make it easy, a game is something that plays over a period of time wherein the participants are aware of the objectives and the goals and seek to resolve a satisfactory solution wherein they succeed, they get to their objective. Hey, Derek, welcome to the show. Uh, we're uh, just now in the process of defining games in uh, terms of the Game Market Guru's definition as compared with society's definition. For background, a, a quick uh, reminder, society's definition of games come from the development of sociology and the study of human interaction uh, without regard to individual humans. And that includes the definition of game that says that a game is the interconnection between two or more human beings wherein the interaction itself adds no net value. Mathematically and sociologically, that's a beneficial definition because it allows the interaction to be judged on its own merit, not with respect to the individual participants. On the other hand, it's a very boring definition and it inherently devalues the game mechanic. Uh, in in the case of the game market guru's definition, my definition of a game is any social interaction where the participants know that the event is going to last for a limited amount of time, that there are set objectives, and there is the opportunity for a resolution that is favorable to that individual player. Now, once you have this definition of a game, then looking at what we can use to develop our social skills and our business 
skills becomes easier because we start to look at the individual game from a, well, the modern term is metaphysical or meta game environment and look at it not from the standpoint of the immersion of the game being part of the story of the game or whatever, but by being outside of it and then judging what it is that we get as a result. Got another block of back. They, this interaction therefore becomes essential in communication. Uh, what I often talk about is consider two children, say age four, who have, who have uh, they're sitting at around a table with uh, their particular toys. In this case, I'll use the example of GI Joes. Child A has a GI Joe, child B has a GI Joe, but not, there are no rules for the use of those GI Joes. There are no rules for toys. There are simply, um, there are simply two individuals with objects. And since the toys have no rules, the players have no means for conveying meaning to one another. And so a conversation between those two players would be something along the lines of, hey, Jimmy, my GI Joe can kick really high, see? Whereas boy B, Tommy might go, well, you know, my, mine, mine actually punches really strong, see? And so the interaction is simply a matter of uh, vicariously noting the activity of the other without any interconnection, any joined or shared experience. Now take those same two boys and put them on opposite sides of a checkerboard. Take the time to teach them the basic rules of checkers and you have a completely different experience, you see, because each participant had to accept and learn a set of rules outside of their own existence in order to participate. And in doing so, they are given the tools to, to be successful in the endeavor of winning the game, but they're depending upon a vocabulary and a subsummation of their own will to the nature of the game in order for the experience to reach them both. This leads, therefore, both participants to be more social and to understand and grasp concepts of human interaction in a way that perhaps is more useful to them. So let's go with the example of checkers. What kind of skills does an individual learn when playing a, a simple game of checkers? Well, obviously the first thing that we can see is that each participant has a turn or a series of actions that they're permitted to do without input from their opponent. And then that opponent then has a separate turn, a separate time to respond. And it goes back and forth. So the players learn a real simple concept of give and take. And a, let's say an individual who did not have a games background, had never played any games in their entire life, would not understand the very concept even of having to uh, give up some of their time, in other words, uh, in order for there to be a player response from the other side. So even at the most basic, the concept of give and take of two voices speaking and one person speaking and the other one hearing and, and vice versa starts to develop. The concept of winning itself is actually an output from gameplay because without having the arbitrary definition of a winning condition, two people playing, number one, would have no concept of uh, wins or losses, uh, success or failure. So simply playing a game of checkers where a person who has no checkers left on the board loses, it becomes pretty, uh, pretty clear. And by having a clear understanding of win and loss, of success and failure, the human, human condition begins to alter and change. Now, if the only game you ever played in your entire life was checkers, you obviously would have learned some important lessons 
the give and take, speak and listen, move and counter move. But there would not have been any dimensionality to that learning. So let's talk a little bit about social skills in general. There are hundreds of sociologists and students of the human condition out there who would have their own defining characteristics for what, in, what in, defines a human engagement. But for the sake of our discussion, uh, let, let's assume that every discussion, every conflict is itself some form of game. And on a perhaps a grand scale, life itself is a game, and hence the, the book I wrote, Your Life, Your Game, Your Move, because life itself is of a limited duration, and uh, each of us can learn the objectives of living and develop a strategy for achieving our personal win conditions. So every life is itself a game in its entirety. But again, going down to the microcosmic level here, we're talking about just one engagement. Let's, let's say you're wanting to develop uh, the social skill of being polite. When I was a child, there was a game that was played quite a lot called Mother May I, which fundamentally was teaching children to politely ask for things instead of just simply taking, which of course is a uh, social advantage. We, we want to be able to carry on the conversation at that level and engage politely to have a give and take that uh, provides both players with a uh, positive response. So Mother May I was a great, a great example of a game that taught, uh, even at the microscopic level, the idea of being polite about asking for instead of just taking. Conversely, let's, let's take a, a, another tabletop game called War, wherein you are matching card face values and the person with the higher face value, quote, wins the match and then you play the next pair of cards and so on. And when two cards come up identically valued, you know, two jacks or two tens or whatever, then the, each player spins off four, four cards and that fourth card's value is the one that matters. It's kind of a, a petty randomness test and ultimately the winner or loser has more to do with the luck of the flip and the luck of the luck of the draw so to speak but the regulating factors of the game uh, help to teach uh, the concepts of sometimes you win sometimes you lose the concept of warfare in a microscopic level and takes a look at um, the value of the cards, in other words, when you lose four cards in a, in a transfer during war, that's a more brutal loss than a single card loss. But where I'm going with this is that our social interaction as human beings is dependent upon our ability to engage with others in a manner that is at once polite, but also is powerful. And unless we learn these tools through uh, gameplay and interaction at that level, then all we end up doing is feeling futile. Uh, thanks, Chris, for hopping on for as long as you did. I appreciate that. So if we're engaging through gameplay, we're doing so in, in, in a light, lighter level. And I guess the, the point is uh, of dealing with that in particular is that we as individuals are by nature playful. We, we, we like banter, we like engagement, we like to go head to head. And so by grabbing uh, grabbing the situation in an abstract way, 
we can be playful about it and yet learn the larger lesson. When I was, uh, again, again, going back to my childhood, when I was little, my parents wanted me to learn relatively quickly not to uh, meddle with things that were uh, not intended for my meddling. We had a couple of ceramic cat statues, I remember, and they were very fragile. They were from, I believe, China or Siam or whatever, but the two cat statues were very, very fragile. And so my parents wanted me to learn uh, to not touch them. And they were beautiful and they were shiny and sparkly. And of course, every child would want to reach out and touch them. But uh, each time I would attempt to, they would pat the back of my hands and say no, and then sit back and watch and wait again for me to do it again. After about the third time, I would actually try to reach for it and then shake my own head because I realized that it was going to cause the pain to the back of my hand, and that it was I wasn't supposed to do that. That was a painful experience, but far less so than perhaps if I had actually knocked over one of the pieces and cut myself. So uh, the, the point being, even in that small example, the, the, the rules of the game are don't touch this. And if you touch this, you will be punished and you will feel a little bit of pain. And it worked, it, it helped to educate. So when we go to the Macroscope, macroscopic level and we look at social interaction in our culture play, by playing the different kinds of board games and, and card games that are out there we have an opportunity to pick up new and learn new skills in communication games like settlers of Catan which I now I know now know is just called Catan as a, an example that game teaches the concept of trade and negotiation on a very rudimentary level and certainly the survival of a species sounds a lot more important than the game gameplay would reflect because you're only adding little tiny wooden pieces to a board but the greater message is No, that's nothing. I thought it was something important. Um, the skill of negotiation, however, becomes a plaything in the case of Catan. And yet you do learn polite ways to ask for things or uh, recommendations and suggestions that help to achieve your goals, but while it also teaches co uh, cooperation uh, in a game, which is uh, another innovation that allows the participants to see the value in sharing information, despite the direct aspect of it. Other examples. I mean, I could go on with a hundred different examples, but the reality is I'm at a half an hour and uh, I've had exactly two people visit the show and I uh, have had no interaction. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude the show a little bit early. Um, thank you for your participation. Those of you that did hop in and I'll talk to you again soon.